that uh, we watched the Truth Project, uh, Del Tacken, he's a, he's a good teacher, and what do you do once you know the truth? What are you supposed to do once you know the truth? You're supposed to engage. You're supposed to be out there uh, letting people know why you're still here. And Del Tackett has a good way of putting this whole thing together. So let's pray and ask the Lord to just send his spirit that he might learn, open up the eyes. That song, open up the, the eyes of our heart, Lord, here tonight as we listen to your word taught to us by Mr. Del Tackett, Lord. And another uh, step on what we're supposed to be doing with the salvation that you gave us, engaging in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. to get your eyes off of the meta narrative to get Greetings to all of you, and I really am happy that you're all here. We have walked through the meta narrative of God, and we began looking at that incredible epic called Creation, where I was astounded when we looked at the nature of God and find that God Himself has created His creatures in such a way that he equips them, empowers them, and then he sends them. Because God wants to work through his creatures to bring forth fruit, and that fruit brings glory to God. And then we had to walk through the next epic, the epic of the fall. It was a hard one for us. Because we were looking at what had happened to that glorious creation that God made in the beginning. And now everything, instead of being pulled towards life and fruitfulness, now everything is inexorably being pulled towards death and decay. Yes. It's here we now find 
the seeds don't always flourish and things are pulled towards unfruitfulness. <laughs> but now, and this is my favorite tour, now we are going to turn our attention to this third epic. We call it redemption. And this is the one that you know as well as I do. This is where we find that God has come and he has redeemed us uh, from the world of darkness. And so we're going to finally, in this epic, turn and gaze upon the face of God. And I know you've been anxious to see that, and we are going to see that now. But first, we are going to go back again to the garden, where God did the unthinkable. Now, realize again the situation that we were in. God had created the universe in such a way that everything was flourishing. There was no death. We don't understand that kind of a world. It's as foreign to us to think of things that flourish without weeds, without death, without decay. And everything had now tipped. All of that was now changed. Everything is pulling towards death and decay and misery. Paul says the creation groans. We groan in this state. And so here we are now at the crime scene. And assembled before God are the criminals, three of them. Satan, Adam, and Eve. In the midst of this destruction, do you think that God could have taken in a deep breath and let out a roar that annihilated everything? Yeah. You know, and just start. Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't he just start all over again? I mean, that would be like, you know, an artist who's made this amazing sketch and someone comes and spills coffee all over it. And you wad it up, throw it away, and you start again. I mean, that would have been kind of nice, wouldn't it? Do you think God could have done that? I don't think he could have. And I don't think he could have because of the crown jewel in the nature of God. Because in the midst of this crime scene, God did the unthinkable. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been Adam, now standing there before God? When I was 16, my dad, my dad had a very difficult life. He never really knew his parents. He grew up almost uh, like a hired hand, tossed to and fro, even as a little boy. And he finally got to the point where he could buy a new car. But my dad, you needed to know my dad. He didn't want to just buy a new car. He wanted to order a new car. And he didn't want to just wait for it to arrive. He wanted to go to Detroit and be there when it rolled off the assembly line, his special order new car. And he flew to Detroit from Idaho. And he drove his special order new car to Idaho, and I wrecked it. No, I hope you don't find that to be funny. It wasn't funny. I had to stand before my dad. I had to wait for him to get home from work and say, Dad, I wrecked your special order of brand new car. It would, what would have been like to have been at him? and stand before God and say, we wreck the universe. Yeah. And so God could have taken in a deep breath and let out a roar of annihilation, but instead, he did the unthinkable. He took in a deep breath, and instead of letting out a roar of annihilation, he breathed out a promise. Theologians call it the proto-evangel. The first moment in the scriptures when we see 
the good news presented. It was mysterious, as a lot of prophecies and promises that point forward are often a little hidden. But nevertheless, it was a promise. It, was, it wasn't an obliteration. It was a promise. Mysterious, yes. But hidden in here was the promise that one would come and make it all right again. So look at what God said. Speaking to Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Mysterious, but when we look back at it, it all makes sense. But it was enough for Adam and Eve to know that there was a promise here. That someone would come and make it all right again. And did you notice, right from the get-go, God says there is going to be a war. And there's going to be a war between you, speaking to Satan, between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. Okay, that's a little strange for us because the woman doesn't really carry the seed. The male carries the seed. And so that seems a little strange. But now, looking back, we know exactly what God was saying. And Satan doesn't have a wife and kids. But remember when Jesus was speaking about Satan and he was speaking to the, the Jewish people at that time. And he said, you belong to your father, what? The devil, the devil your father, the devil. Yeah. And so Satan does have a seed line and the Messiah had a seed line and there was going to be a war between those two seed lines. Yeah. And I would submit to you that the Old Testament is primarily the story of the war between those two seed lines. And God was going to bring forth that seed no matter what. And this was the promise that God had made right there in the, in the middle of the crime scene. The promise was in the seed. Isn't that amazing? The promise was in the seed. Right from the beginning, when we looked at creation, the seed represented this whole thing we've been talking about. God who creates his creatures and gives them, he charges them, that they will be agents of life to bring forth new life through the seed. And now the promise is in the seed. And God kept this promise, nurturing it, protecting it, even when the, the Messiah's seed line was incorrigible. Yes. He nurtured it and protected it, tended it, until, until Galatians 4, we now have, when the set time, when the fullness of time, this is the Kairos moment. It, this was not just the calendar flipped around and we just happened to land on some date. This was a Kairos moment. This was as if every promise and every prophecy had been set on a timer to all go off now. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. And that was exactly what God had promised. This, my friends, is the greatest send of all. We've been talking about God sending. This is the greatest send 
of all. It's possible that it is here in the middle of the night, spoken to a member of the Sanhedrin, in the words of, of Jesus that had become the primary Christian verse of all time, which is John 3.16. Thank you. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the ultimate sin. Why did God send? Why did God ultimately send his son? It's right here. What is it? He loved. He loved. For God so loved the world that he did all of this. In 1 John we read that God is love. And this is the crown jewel in the nature of God. That God is love. That's the crown jewel. <coughs> so we've reached our quest. Why are we disappointed? We have gazed upon the crown jewel in the nature of God and it should buckle our knees But it doesn't. Why are we disappointed? Well, maybe it's because we've become immune to it. Maybe this word just doesn't mean anything to us anymore. Maybe we're so in, inundated with counterfeits that have twisted it. Maybe someone has broken this word. Yeah. And I think we have to recover it in order for us to fully understand why this is truly the crown jewel in the nature of God. So what is love? How does the world use it? If I were to, as I used to do in the seminary, and uh, send you out into the mall with your little clipboards and I say, okay, here's your assignment. Go to the mall and spend an hour or two hours in the mall and listen for any time someone says the word love. Write it down and bring it back. What do you think you would hear? What's that? I thank you, sir. I love, yeah, you would say, or I'd say, I love these jeans, right? Or? I love french fries. Pardon me? I love French fries. Yes. I love this color. I love this song. I love all of this stuff. Oh, do you understand how we're using this? Because that's exactly right. That's what we hear. We hear it all the time. I love banjo. I love this song. I love barbecue. I love my morning coffee. And I love having lunch with my daughter. I love a cold beer. I love hockey. I love my Legos. I love working out. I love flowers. I love this book. I love my dog. I love my truck. And I love you. <laughs> okay, so think about this for a minute. What are we really saying when we say these things? If I say I love this song, what do we mean by that? Not the way it makes you feel. Let me put it this way. I love this song because it enhances my script. 
I love this car because it enhances my script. I love this because it enhances my story, enhances my script. What do you think it means when we say, I love you? What does that mean? Wow. You enhance my script? <laughs> what happens if you don't enhance my script anymore? What kind of love is that? Who? Hmm. We don't know. We don't know what it means anymore. It's lost on us. <laughs> You know, I think too much, so I'm definitely giving thoughts to this question of what is love? Love. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Gosh, what is love? I don't think I have the exact answer. Love is diff it's just difficult to understand. <laughs> I'm not going to mess up love by just trying to find this. So from the way we use the word love, um, I love you, I love this, I love that, I love playing drums, I love music, I love recording, I love being in the studio. I love the stars. I love poetry. I love Vincent van Gogh. What I really love is myself. Love is tolerance and acceptance. I think, I think what everybody's looking for is um, someone else to embrace their otherness. To me, to love someone is to have the choice to accept them for who they are. Accepted, absolutely. Love, love to me is a feeling of being accepted appreciated, cared for. I think love is almost like a three parts thing. I think our feelings, our thinking, and our action. It's a verb and it's a constant decision, I think. I think, and I don't really know. But are, are we to say, well, so what? I mean, I mean, it's just a word. I mean, it's just four letters. What, is, what does that really matter? Are, are words really that important? Yes. Well, I would say the scripture says they're very important. Remember, Jesus was talking about one jot in the law, one tittle in the law. That's how important it is. Paul, Paul is making a key argument in the scripture when he's arguing in Galatians. And the point of his argument is based upon whether or not a word is singular or plural. I remember when I first read Webster's uh, 1828 dictionary and I read the preface to it because in the preface, it was astounding to me to Noah Webster felt he was called to write the dictionary. And he says he was called to write the dictionary because he said words are, are so important, they're critical. Yeah. And he starts off by saying when God spoke, he formed the, wor the world, he created things through words. And when he revealed himself to us through special revelation, he used words. And Webster said words are important and the meaning of words are important. What would happen if we all had different meanings for all the words? It would mean our language would mean nothing anymore. And so he said, God's called me to write a dictionary. And it shouldn't surprise us that there is a battle over words. Are we not in a battle over words today in our culture? Yeah. Yeah. Has the word marriage become mm -hmm. a battleground? Male and female, believe it or not, male and female are now a battleground. Not between male and female, a battleground over what the word male means and female. Words are very important. Peter speaking to Jesus, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The enemy turns words of life into words of death. Yes. Now, one of the things we find in talking about the Scripture is that there are two great themes in the Scripture. In the Truth Project, we talked about one of them, and all of the other things we've done up to this point have talked about truth, and now we're going to talk about love. Because those are the two great things 
in the scripture. And they go hand in glove, or horse and carriage, or whatever, whatever the words are now. They, these two are so deeply intertwined in the scripture that I will submit to you that you cannot take them apart and if you try to do that, you will lose them both. You cannot have love without truth. And I will submit to you, you can't really have truth without love. That's how closely knit these two are together. And one of our problems we have in our culture is that we do try to do that. We have some people in our culture just want to talk about love. And they and begin to define love Love is not ever speaking truth. Now, they wouldn't say it that way, but you know what I'm talking about? As soon as you start speaking truth, you're no longer loving. That's what some people would say. And we have others, unfortunately, even in evangelical Christianity, who want to speak truth, but there is no love there. And, and I, you know, that's not, that's not really truth when you speak it that way. So what does this word mean? Well, what's interesting is that we're not really sure. The word we're talking about in the scripture comes from the Greek word agape. We could speak of agapeo, agape. We will use the common thing that we refer to it as agape. That is the Greek word that we're talking about here. It's the Greek word that is used in John 3.16. It's the one that's used in all these that you will see here today. Most all of our Greek words in the New Testament are found in extra-biblical manuscripts. It'd be like if an alien came here and wanted to know what in the world we're saying. You could read all kinds of novels and books and so forth and eventually help him understand what we're saying by the context of those words. And that's true with almost all the words in, uh, in the New Testament with the exception of agape. That word is seldom found in any of the extra biblical manuscripts. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit was reserving this word for us. But it makes it a little more difficult for us then to define it. I think if we go back to the nature of God, and that's what we have been doing, and that's what we're doing throughout the meta narrative, whether you know it or not, that's what we've been looking at from the very beginning, is to try to understand what does this mean? And we will define it based on what we see in the very nature of God. And so here is how we're going to define true agape love. That true agape love is the sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another. The sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good, the shalom of another. Now notice something. This true love, this true agape love, is totally centered on someone else. What did we just get through saying how we use this word? It's totally centered on me. True agape love is totally centered on another. It has nothing to do with my benefit, and it has nothing to do with how much you've earned it. It is unearned. And there is sacrifice in all of it. We've, we've talked about this, have we not already? There is sacrifice that is required to truly love someone else. And it seeks their true good. It seeks their shalom. And what it is not, it is not selfish. It's not manipulative. It doesn't hold back truth. It's not a handout that creates dependency. It's not feigned. Remember, remember Judas? Remember when, when the alabaster jar was broken and Judas got all huffy? Yep. And he said, oh, this could have been sold 
money given to the poor. <laughs> and, and we, if, if it wasn't explained to us, we would say, oh, Judas, Judas had a love for the poor. But the scripture says he didn't care about the poor. What he wanted was money. He wanted power. Well, guess what? That happens today. It's not self-centered. It's not all about my script. Do you remember Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper? When Da Vinci painted this, he painted it, of course, with a table and chairs and so on and so forth, but that's probably not how this looked. It would probably, they were seated at a triclinium, and a triclinium is a three-sided table that allowed uh, those who were serving to come in, and people were seated around the table like this, and so the disciples were seated here around this table, and the honored guest was sitting in this position. That would have been Jesus. Jesus. The host was probably sitting here. He's the one who's paying for the meal and all that kind of stuff. Who was that? Judas. 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 Who was sitting next to Jesus? John. 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 Yes, remember he leaned back on the breast of Jesus that night. And so when we look at Da Vinci's painting, Da Vinci, I think, fell into the same trap that a lot of people do, and that is that because John, remember, who wrote about truth more than anybody else? I remember people coming up to me after the truth talking, man, man, we, we, read, we read from John all the time because he speaks about truth. And now I hope you're going to find, so man, we read about love everywhere from John. It is not interesting. But because of our perception that love has become this soft, you know what I mean, this kind of very soft and effeminate kind of a thing. And so John, went, uh, uh, Da Vinci, when he painted John, he painted John as a very effeminate looking person. Now, some people have made a lot of money off of writing books about this is a conspiracy and all of that, all of that stuff. But John, do you remember John had a brother, his name was? James. James. James and John were brothers and Jesus gave them a nickname. Do you remember that? What would it have been like? Wouldn't it be cool? Say, yeah, yeah Jesus and I we're pretty tight, you know. He's even got a nickname for me. I mean, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, Jesus has a nickname for me. That's how, that's how close we are. And what was the nickname? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder, that's exactly right. Because remember, remember that time when the town didn't accept them? And James and John are there, and they say, oh, don't call down fire on these people. Call down fire, burn them up. And Jesus, that's what Jesus is like, Sons of Thunder. That's who this guy is. He's a son of thunder. Da Vinci should have painted him like this. <laughs> because true agape love is not for wimps. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, true agape love is going to cost you something. <laughs> There isn't anything we can think of that costs anybody in this world more than Jesus Christ, who paid everything, who suffered everything because of his true agape love for you. This is not some cotton candy touchy-feely kind of a thing. This requires strength and courage and the power of God. So this, and this is not a minor thing in the scripture. And I, go, I know you guys know this, 
And it's, it's why Jesus was sent. We already looked at that. This is why God came into the world, because of the crown jewel in his nature. This is why he died for us. He demonstrated his true agape love and died for us. It's a big deal. So hang on, hang on for a second because I'm gonna check the waiver here. I'm gonna make sure, okay, we got the waiver signed. It's a big deal. This is what John writes. If we don't love each other, I'm not saying this, okay? I'm not saying this. God is saying this through John. The Holy Spirit is saying if we don't have this agape love for each other, it says then we don't love God. And then he says if we don't have this agape love, we abide in death. If we don't have this, we don't know God. Man. And if you don't have agape, this is the famous chapter, right, on, on love. Agape, love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want you to take note of what this is saying. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have true agape love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Listen to that. What is the most prominent thing you hear? fades away. It made a big noise and then it fades away to nothing. Yeah. And that's exactly what God is saying to us. If you speak with the tongues of men and angels but you do not have true agape love, you become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And then it goes on, it says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries, if I know all knowledge, if I have all faith, even to remove mountains, but if I do not have true agape love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have true agape love, it profits me nothing. Now, I, I don't want to... I don't want to beat the dead horse here. But if you think, and, and I, I, thought, I thought deep about it. I mean, I tried to put myself in a position of thinking, what if people all over the world wanted to tune in to hear my broadcast? Because I was a silver tongued. People hung on every word. And the scripture says, if you were the best teacher in the world and you didn't have true copy love, it was nothing. If I was the smartest person in the world, everybody in the world came to, to hear the intellect. You had an IQ that was off the charts. But if you don't have a copy love, it, it means nothing. If I'm the most spiritual person ever, I'm a Mother Teresa cubed, whatever. The scriptures say it, it, it amounts to nothing. If you could perform miracles, if you could part the Atlantic Ocean, it, whatever, you could raise everybody in the cemetery. It, if you don't have this thing, the scripture is saying it's, it's worthless. <coughs> Give away everything. Give your life away. Become a martyr. What I'm saying is this, there is something about this that the scripture is telling us this is important. And then this, the passage goes on then to talk about what it is and what it isn't. I have them listed here. This, this characteristic of true agape love, it is patient, it is kind. 
It endures all things. It never ends. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It doesn't brag. It's not selfish. True agape love is a sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another. And I will submit to you that this is the answer to our questions as to why did Jesus leave? And why does God send? And what is God's end game? All of those are bound up in the crown jewel of God because of his True agape love for you. He has a sacrificial zeal that seeks your shalom. Can you believe that? Can you believe the God of the universe has a sacrificial zeal that seeks your shalom? That seeks your true good? That's amazing to me. But now there's something even deeper because this sacrificial zeal is seeking the true good of an enemy. Yes. Who has ever heard of such a thing? That anyone would have a sacrificial zeal that seeks the shalom of an enemy. We have, in this context, it's called grace. Grace is when God extends <coughs> his true agape love for those who hate him. <clears throat> who is this God? Who extends that love to the ungodly? To sinners? To enemies? <clears throat> to those who are hostile? Evil? dead who has heard of such a thing who is this God but there's something even deeper and I want to introduce you to another Hebrew word and it is an, an amazing word and we're going to try to pronounce it as best we can because it would be easy to mispronounce this. When I try to pronounce it and try to get other people to pronounce it, it's really difficult because you have to almost spit on people and it's got this kind of a thing in there. But here's what we're going to do. It is chesed. The C is silent. And we will just speak it as it looks. Chesed. And I want you to learn that. Chesed. It is an amazing word. And what's interesting is it too is a word in the Old Testament that we have trouble translating. <coughs> And that's why you will find all of these different ways that it's translated. The NIV, the New American Standard, Luther, they translate it differently. And all of these, it's translated in all different kinds of ways. I, I personally prefer the, the ESV's translation, the steadfast love of God. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the steadfast love of God that never gives up, it never quits, it never stops. 
It never halts in its pursuit of its purpose to seek your shalom. Never. Even when we don't return his love, even when we are stiff-necked, even when we are just plain stupid, <coughs> it's extended steadfastly. That's, this, this is the grace word in the Old Testament. Not just to the level, not just to those who deserve it, but it is a sacrificial zeal that steadfastly seeks the true good, the shalom of those who were ungodly. Those who were hostile to God, doing evil deeds to God's enemies. And so we have to ask, who is this God? I'll tell you who he is. He's the one, remember, we talked about in the garden. The one who breathed out a promise instead of evaporating everything. He's the one who spared the seed line in Noah's day. When the scripture said every thought of man's heart was only evil all the time. He's the one who protected the seed line through continuous rebellion against him, continually complaining. He was the one who com was committed to bring forth the promised seed no matter what. He's the one who affirmed his commitment to Abraham and Isaac, to David, through all the prophets. And he is the one who is committed to you, the elect before the foundation of the world. And it is that God who will never, ever let you go. Ever. Because you're his. And is the true agape, chesed love of God that is going to seek your true good all the way to the end of time. And he has a sacrificial zeal to do this. This is one of our great Christmas passages from Isaiah. You know, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom. Of the greatness of his government and shalom, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Even when it appeared as if the promises were all lost, I can imagine in this battle, there were moments when Satan said, I've won. Jerusalem has been destroyed. The children of Israel are all sacked and headed off. Now they're carted off to foreign lands. And it appears as he's won. But in one of my, the, it has to be one of my most favorite passages in the Old Testament is this passage right here. Because in the midst when everything looked like it was over, there was nothing but a stump left that God comes and he says, huh, mm, the holy seed is in the stump. What, can you believe that? This is the steadfast God who says, oh, you may see, yes, that's right. Judgment has come here, and all you see is an old stump, but let me tell you something. The 
holy seed is in the stump. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. We talked about in our in Tour Zero, we find ourselves living in difficult times. But you and I are a remnant of hope. Why? Because the Spirit of God is in the stump. The Spirit of God is in the remnant, and they're still there. The world may laugh and say, oh, it's over. No, no. So we're going to add this Hesed love to our definition, and we will now define it as the steadfast sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good, the shalom of another. Why well, would Satan want to dedicate so much time and trouble to destroy one little word? Because that word represents the crown jewel in the nature of God. This is one of my favorite hymns. The comes from an old uh, Jewish poem. The love of God. It's the it's this third verse that is so so beautiful to me. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a stri a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. How measure 
Could the scroll contain the whole? Go stretch from sky to sky. Go to love of God. Would you please stand with me and we will read these great words from Romans. What shall we say? to these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and amen. Amen. We can play it uh, on the uh, recording. <laughs> you know, the Corinthian scripture that he was given, uh, love is patient, love is kind. It's always an interesting thing to stick Jesus' name in there and go through the whole list. Oh, Jesus yes. is patient, Jesus is kind. Uh, and go through the entire list. And then you go back and stick your name in there. Yeah. No. And if that doesn't let you know that you've got right. some work to do, yeah. and it wakes you up. Amen. Uh, but uh, yeah, I like Mr. Tackett's teaching. Uh, he goes deep. And that's one thing we like to do here on Wednesday night is we go deep. Uh, pantry's about, and by the time we get done with this series, we'll get back to looking for those golden nuggets, but you'll have to deal with them with a pastor. <laughs> uh, we need to work on love. I mean, I... Oh, yes. Well, then, still get it up. Some we need to work on love. Some of us more than others. And... Any time that we're looking at somebody else's and the faults in somebody, Amen. Uh, what are you really looking at? You're looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our own script. Yeah, our own script. Yeah. So we finally got the message out on Sunday. You know, you're not being a very good signpost. Yeah. 
this way to Jesus when your disciple says, "Here I am." Oh yes. So, and it's hard to get around that. I'm not. I'm not done. Uh, I wish I could write like Paul and say, uh, "Hey, uh, you know, whatever you see and and experience in me, that, that this put into practice." Uh, we have a whole bunch of sinners out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have some work to do on love. And uh, Ephesians 5 1 says that we need to be imitators of God. We never be God. We can never have that kind of love. We just can't. I'm sorry. But we can aspire to be imitators of God. Amen. Yeah. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, uh, help us in this task, Lord. Uh, probably the first thing we should say when we speak to you, Lord, is give us more love. Uh, take the focus off ourselves and, and onto that other person, Lord. Uh, and always be able to look at that other person through your eyes, through your eyes, Lord. Uh, no matter what we might think, on our own, in our own script. When we look through your eyes, we see a man that you, or a woman that you died for. Help us to always look that way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good night to you.